her because I prepared everything in English, but my slides are in German anyway, because the discussion I'm referring to is so uh, German-speaking located. So I decided not to translate my slides because it felt kind of odd. But in any case, if, if anyone needs a translation, and maybe I'm switching to German, so it shouldn't be a problem. Okay. My name is Julia, Julia Ethofer, and I've been invited to talk about the contentious relation of criticism of anti-Semitism and anti-Muslim racism, which um, is due to the fact that, I don't know, <laughs> maybe I published some articles on, on the topic, but I actually never uh, published something um, relating to inner leftist struggles about this topic and to, to inner leftist contentions. So this is actually my first talk <laughs> on this topic and it feels a bit odd. I wanted to um, prepare it in a, in a like theoretical way, but uh, after a while I decided not to do that and um, do it in a very, very empirical way. So um, there is going to be a lot of slides with a lot of text, mostly from Jungle World. I'm pretty sure that everybody knows uh, this leftist um, periodical, um, which I find problematic. And on the other hand, well, introductorily, um, uh, I'm going to focus on anti-racist, like blind spots regarding uh, the criticism of anti-Semitism before um, focusing on jungle words articles, which in, in, in my view uh, point out the blurring of uh, a ideology, critical uh, criticism of, of religion, of Islam, uh, in this special case, and uh, homogenizing anti-Muslim stereotypes. Yeah, so as I said, I choose strictly to focus on comments. Um, I just want to um, contextualize a bit my, my whole like, um, approach to this inner leftist contentions. I'm a migration sociologist. I worked in migration studies for about 10 years uh, in Auftragsforschungsprojects. And like 10 years ago, I noticed <laughs> that the discourse um, is going more and more in direction uh, culturalizing um, anti Muslim stereotyping of social problems or like framing of, of social problems. In 2006, for instance, I participated in a, from my perspective, quite important study about uh, arranged and so-called forced marriages in, in Austria. And uh, what I learned um, presenting our outcomes um, was that, like, one of our main outcomes was that uh, the extent of this problem is not known which is due to the simple fact that there is no uh, representative study on domestic violence against women, of which forced and uh, arranged, or mainly forced marriages could be a part. So that was our, like, uh, one of our main um, outcomes. And this got challenged very much because there was a very um, strong, I would call it desire to know more about how the Muslim patriarch um, um, treats his um, women, daughters, and so on and so forth. So this is more than 10 years ago, and since then it's like part of my personal like analysis, <laughs> how I look at things, and um, a few years ago I started to work on Israel-related anti-Semitism, in the Viennese left, on the anti-imperialist, so to speak. And um, in doing that, of course, also on Israel solidarity context, meaning like um, ideology, critical context in solidarity with Israel. 
and their important criticism towards uh, leftist Israel related anti Semitism. But if you look at the debates, at least like start, they started off in Vienna at the beginning of the 2000s after the so called Second Intifada. And they soon trans also transformed uh, more and more into culturalizing debates because uh, what was at stake um, more and more was like also mostly more Islamized anti Semitism. Yeah. So I, I don't agree <laughs> with um, neither of the stances. I, I, I'm, uh, of course, critical towards anti imperialist anti Semitism, but I also like. Yeah, <laughs> have some analytical problems uh, with ideology critical stances, which is due to the fact that they just ignore anti Muslim uh, racism and partly also reproduce it. Introductorily, I just want to skip through um, current statistics um, because it's more and more a topic also in, in, in social research. Sorry for this uh, shitty graph. Um, this is a study by Kenan Günger and Caroline Nignafs. It's, it's uh, published very recently, uh, this fall, 2016. And um, it was a study conducted in, wait, let me see. Um, more than 30 Viennese youth work facilities uh, with a, a group of respondents of uh, 400 youngsters, about half of them identifying as Muslims, and the outcomes have to be taken seriously if one wants to take seriously uh, current anti-Semitism, which is also an Islamized one. Um, on the one hand, radicalization tendencies um, amount to 27%, which is much more, and all in all to uh, 58%, which is um, much more than in the um, reference group. And the same holds true for um, outgroup hostility uh, in terms of anti-Semitism, homophobia, and anti-democratic attitudes or, or views. Uh, the white column is uh, like the reference group which is not identified as Muslim and uh, the 47% uh, regarding anti-Semitism is uh, respondents, you youngsters um, responding and identifying as Muslims. Some years ago in 2014 um, there has been another like much debated study published by Ruth Koopmans, uh, who is based in Berlin. Uh, it was called Religious Fundamentalism and Outgroup Hostility Among Muslims and Christians in Western Europe. So you can also see here that Christians and Muslims get compared from the beginning on. Six countries participated, namely Germany, France, Netherlands, Belgium, Sweden, and Austria. And here again, I hope you can see it. Yeah, I think it's. Uh, quite clear, um, the interrelation of fundamentalist attitudes and outgroup hostility um, regarding the outcomes are to be taken seriously and both score uh, considerably higher in within the group of um, Muslims, which is of course not a homogeneous one, but anyhow, uh, this is how statistics works. Uh, interesting that uh, it scores higher uh, regarding the first generation and considerably lower uh, regarding the second generation. Same uh, outcomes uh, regarding outgroup hostility, which is always connected uh, to anti democratic attitudes or stances. Uh, there was one item to measure um, anti-Semitism, uh, the item Jews cannot be trusted, and also here you can see that um, yeah, respondents identifying as Muslims score much higher. What I did um, was not on a statistically empirical level, I did a sort of frame analysis how people identifying as Muslims frame um, Israel. I did that in the wake of the uh, Gaza war in 2014, 
mainly um, collecting material uh, which was published on the Facebook webpage of the UETD, the Union of European Turkish Democrats uh, in, in Vienna, which is de facto an AKP, um, a, a European AKP organization. Um, I coll collected a lot of um, quite scary material. This is only a, a little glimpse to show that like every feature of, of anti-Semitism, of very open anti-Semitism, uh, got articulated uh, during the Facebook mobilization for the, the biggest anti-Israel rally in July, on 20th July 2014. So you have here blood level references. You had a lot of uh, Verschwörungstheory. Um, what's that in English? Conspiracy. Conspiracy theory, thank you. You had uh, plenty of uh, NS comparisons and you also had very open eliminatory anti-Semitism. This is a picture which Travis, obviously, um, a colleague of mine from Germany uh, collected very similar pictures in Palestinian refugee camps uh, and it says I could have killed all Jews but I left some alive uh, to show you why I killed them. So to cut it short, um, the Islamization of anti-Semitism is definitely a problem uh, which is to be tackled. Uh, if one wants to address uh, anti-Semitism, like current, current one. Uh, but on the other hand, in summer 2014, also the hegemonic discourse sort of cracked in, in, in my view. I did not only collect like mobilization, um, empirical stuff from mobilization, uh, for anti-Israel rallies organized by UATD in this special case, but I also collected um, internet discussions uh, like in Kronenzeitung Forum, Heute Forum and other right-wing um, periodicals. And it got very obvious that uh, the anti-Muslim um, discourse which up to 2014 mainly consisted of patriarch patriarchal, um, pre-modern, sexist um, Muslims, uh, cracked in, uh, like, um, it, a new feature got developed, which uh, was uh, a definite, definitely a form of outsourcing of, um, on behalf of the dominant society of anti-Semitism and constructing a um, homogeneous Muslim collective as the new anti-Semites and uh, new Nazis who better should get um, uh, expulsed <laughs> or uh, ripped off um, their Austrian citizenship in order um, uh, to overcome such new fascist tendencies. So 2014 was definitely um, a cracking year with regard to the outsourcing of uh, anti-Semitism onto Muslims. So I started to um, look a bit on the interactions um, and found out <laughs> that uh, not only was this ascription of Muslim being the new anti-Semites used for uh, deflection of Austrian or autochthonous uh, anti-Semitism, but mainly as a, a form of um, verschoben, what's that, a dislocated integration debate. So this was also, um, this was, one of the uh, main features and, and also um, very obvious in the um, um, concluding parts of uh, debates about um, Muslim or Islamized anti-Semitism because the conclusion was always they don't belong here, they, they are aggressive, they, they are Nazis and we should get rid of them. So um, just to cut it short, what I want to say by that, um, not only is this outsourcing going on in a 
highly anti-Semitic Austrian context because up to uh, more than uh, 42 percent some years ago responded uh, to an um, um, inquiry made at the um, Institut für Kommunikationswissenschaft by Professor Gottlich that um, in their view uh, the Israelis would do to the Palestinians the same uh, like the Nazis did to the Jews. So 42% um, articulate a very open secondary Israel related anti-Semitism, but contemporaneously outsource onto uh, Muslim collectives. So this was the introduction about um, <laughs> what I'm doing if I'm not digging into leftist um, contentious debates. <laughs> uh, I want to, um, before um, I, um, I want to touch these debates, I, I, I just want to like, do a short introduction unless uh, I think that actually nobody needs it about the difference between racism and, and anti-Semitism and related a bit to contentious uh, perspectives on the next slide. So anti-Semitism is um, an anti-modern resentment, a negative leitmotif of modernity, as Samuel Salzburg called it. So the, the, the basic feature about it that it uh, works via power projection, which is variable, but uh, it's always attached to the feeling that a we collective is oppressed or colonized by powerful, overwhelming evil forces. And racisms, all forms of different racisms, in, in contrast, uh, if put in psychoanalytical terms, um, there are uh, resentments stemming from uh, the suppressed pleasure principle, from outsourcing suppressed pleasure, or in functionalist terms, um, there are legitimization of uh, colonialism, colonial exploitation, and also uh, genocides. So they outsource in an imagined, like, in, in inferior inferiority, uh, they they work via the description of inferiority. I'm focusing on Orientalism or anti-Muslim racism here, um, which always worked uh, via um, the description of sexual pathologies, despotism, patriarchy, homosexuality, and changed. Uh, after 9-11 in the, in, in, in the last years um, to ascribing more uh, being principally anti-modern and uh, incompatible with enlightened societies uh, and in this way homophobic, anti-Semitic, sexist and a special feature right now is the terrorism frame. Uh, Muslims are like pathological collectives um, aching to terrorism or likely to, to, to uh, yeah, turn into a terror collective. What I want to tackle in the last uh, section of, of, of my lecture is um, that right now you can also observe thinking a bit about like uh, current election outcomes that due to hege hegemonic changes, um, anti-Muslim racism and anti-Semitism, structural anti-Semitism intertwine more and more. So uh, which, which, which uh, does not mean that they function similar. I'm, I'm going to uh, um, illustrate it later on. They are absolutely not the same, but they are more and more intertwined. And I think, from my view, this is a new development uh, which is um, definitely to be tackled more within the left. On the one side, more anti-racist side, or also uh, the side that, like, that um, focuses more on hegemonic theory, follows Gramscian stances should focus more on, on um, structural anti-Semitism and how it works currently, and uh, the, the ideology critical side should definitely focus more on anti-Muslim racism. 
So just a short <laughs> glimpse on the differences uh, between um, these two, two approaches. But this is really in a nutshell. I would say that ideology critical perspectives mainly relate to materialist views, of course, but uh, Wertkritik, criticism of value, uh, very early works were uh, like Peter Schmidt Egner, who also uh, explained colonial racism via uh, a Wertkritische uh, stance in Joachim Brun. And they take, they uh, theorize anti-Semitism and racism as complementary uh, projections, outsource projections, uh, which are uh, structurally produced by capitalism via Wertform, whatever that is in English, capital and, and, and state, capital and state. And there, uh, ever since, at odds uh, with what I would call social constructivist uh, views, Generally, they are also called post-structuralist views, um, mainly or, or heavily influenced also by cultural studies. An early one, um, an early theorist in this field would be Stuart Hall, very interesting, highly interesting, and, and, and also um, currently producing knowledge is Patricia Hill Collins. She focuses very much on anti-black racism, and in the German-speaking context, I think Birgit Rommelsbacher was the first and also post-colonial influenced uh, stances like Castro Maria Doma Castro Varela or Nikita Davan. And they see racism as a social relation. And in this sense, they also focus more on um, interpolation, how, racism in, how racist um, thinking structures interpolate and produce collectives and also on conjunctures. So on, on the um, fact that uh, the form of racism, or no, the superficial form of racism can change and that there can be conjunctures of um, the group in focus, which is also a, a hegemonic uh, point of view. Like um, Manuela Boyachiev and Alex Demirovic, for instance, pointed out years ago in the year 2002 in their book Conjunctures of Racism. This got criticized very much, amongst others, by Stefan Krieger and other um, materialists or Wertkritikerinnen, due to the fact that they already in 2002 um, pointed out that things are changing that hegemonic discourse is changing and that the Muslims or uh, a cultural form of racism uh, projected on the Muslims um, gets more and more hegemonic <laughs> up to a point that um, it started producing a so-called chains of equivalence, equivalence ketten for instance, if you think about the fact that nowadays the right, uh, or also the radical right, meaning the Freedom Party, uh, the Austrian Freedom Party, uh, in focusing on the Muslims, developed a very weird, uh, distorted sort of Israel solidarity in framing Israel as on the forefront against the um, worldwide battle against the Muslim, or in parts Islamist, but actually Muslim threat. This is a classical uh, equivalence kettle. And this happens always when uh, resentment gets hegemonic, which on the other hand does by no means mean that anti-Semitism would be overcome or um, abgelöst, so to speak, by, by uh, anti-Muslim racism. This is what I want to focus uh, in the last section. Yeah. What um, can this social constructivist, post-structuralist uh, view um, tell us about um, cultural racism? Basically how they function via four dimensions. If people start to essentialize um, and construct an Islamic true essence, a Wesenskern of Islam, via homogenizations, um, lack of differences within, dichotomizations, 
the construction of strictly separable cultural entities and uh, where there is no escape from religious socialization and culturalization, obviously. Uh, culture shapes individual. Yeah, and um, <laughs> all these four features, unfortunately, uh, can be found in some of, um, yeah, ideology critically, um, criticisms of Islam. But first I wanna start with uh, the other problematic <laughs> Uh, Auslastung, what's that? Blind spot regarding anti-racist um, stances, because they have a um, huge blind spot uh, with regard to the functionality of um, anti-Semitism, and also um, a very high. Uh, they are very likely not to tackle it uh, in the very moment uh, as soon as. Uh, anti-Semitism articulates uh, in an Islamized way. Yeah? As soon as isms generally are articulated by racialized others, anti-racist stances such as Mosaic, uh, which is a leftist block here in Vienna, uh, tend to uh, not tackle it anymore, not to feed into the hegemonic anti-Muslim discourse. Um, this happened to me last spring uh, uh, Mosaic, the, the blog asked me to contribute a text on the interrelation of Islamism and anti-Semitism and about the fact that uh, anti-racist contexts don't talk about it. And I first wanted to check for whom I'm writing and I, I found out I'm, I'm checking the blog impressum. My conclusion was that I'm writing for Dominanzgesellschafterinnen people pertaining to dominant society, no, not racialized people, but um, Dominanzgesellschafterinnen taking a very um, decided anti-racist stance and focusing on anti-Muslim racism. And I thought, great, <laughs> this is where this text belongs. I'm going to write it, and then they didn't put it online. Uh, after a while, uh, they uh, told me why they uh, let me know that actually they didn't want to have uh, a text about the anti-Semitism of a certain group, but a more general one, because autochthonous anti-Semitism is always something that <laughs> one can discuss. So this is part of my text, and I think that this was the um, part which was um, the incriminated one. Uh, because on the one hand, uh, I wrote about Islamist anti-Semitism, but on the other hand, I'm quoting that now, uh, I also hinted to the fact, like bearing in mind what I collected in summer 2014, um, which from my perspective showed that uh, Islamized anti-Semitism is indeed entering or like also eliminatory uh, pictures are indeed entering uh, the so-called uh, gesellschaftliche Mitte, so s middle of society, uh, of people identifying as Muslims. And this is what uh, I wrote in both letters here. Um, as any radical ideology, this radical ideological fringe can also reach the so-called middle of society, in this case, the middle of society of people identifying as Muslims, if it's not challenged. And this was obvious, for instance, in summer 14, when the increasing Islamization of anti-Semitism peaked. And this was enough for them not to uh, put my text online. And I find it very problematic because uh, from my point of view, um, it's as a wrote <laughs> down there, it's uh, pseudo-anti-racist and also paternalistic uh, form of uh, criticism. I mean, yeah, considering the fact <laughs> that, as I said before, uh, summer 2014 was also a turning point with regard to um, the outsourcing of anti-Semitism onto Muslims, and 
yeah, and a new feature um, was added to the, the anti-Muslim discourse, which was already hegemonic before for years. It's partly understandable that Mosaic says we don't want that on our blog because we, we are sure that it's going to feed into Kronenzeitung heute Österreich stances on the new Nazis, the new uh, anti-Semites. I can understand that, but still um, I think that such a um, criticism of representation has um, very deep politicizing effects in terms of non-differentiation between a political critique uh, and the description of anti-Semitism or Nazism or whatever it may be, patriarchy onto the Muslims. Because in my view, this just didn't happen in, in my text. And um, I also was um, stunned that in their answer, the, audio, the editorial team was so blurry that they didn't even differentiate between um, what I actually wrote about, meaning ES fans, Islamists, people identifying as Islamists, and the um, homogeneously uh, fought uh, Muslim collective. Because this was actually not what my text tackled, uh, Islamized anti-Semitism in general, but uh, Islamist anti-Semitism foremost. So, yeah, it was just this one sentence here below hinting to people identifying as Muslims more general, but still differentiating in my, my view. And this is what I mean by false uh, pseudo anti-racist stances, which ha hardcorely relate to identity politics. Because if you stop differentiating between uh, ES fans, and Muslims in general, that's not a good sign for anti-racist stance. And um, secondly, I, I find such stances very anti-political because um, they just do not take serious political articulations if they are articulated by people um, experiencing racist exclusion on the one hand. And they are also anti-political in the sense that they completely blank out, they silence uh, inner conflicts like hegemonic political struggles within communities, be it communities or be it um, um, societies with nation state stream, uh, labeled as Muslim. Mm? Every stance anti-religious standpoints are framed as uh, feeding into uh, the anti-Muslim racist discourse. Any sort of political discussion within communities labeled as Muslim, all of that uh, is subsumed uh, under this religion frame or culture frame, which is very bad in, in my opinion. And this last feature, uh, got much more obvious in the next dimension I want to illustrate. Um, that's a discussion about uh, a special issue of the leftist journal Malmö on Islamophobia in, in, in spring last year. The most heated debates um, on Facebook, where else? Uh, following this special issue, um, so there were heated debates about um, anti-racist stances criticizing Malmö for being culturally racist in this Islamophobia special issue. One has to say that um, there are some homogenizations, but this is only one feature of cultural racism uh, to be found <laughs> in certain Maimu texts, but uh, generally, I would say it was like more a political critique and uh, also addressing the left and debates started off not with like, the, the whole special issue in general, but due to um, a certain, um, due to a book review at the end of the day, due to like a side um, contribution to, to the special, because the, the author of the book, Fanny Müller-Uri, uh, got angry. <laughs> 
And what popped up then was that um, most of the people, like just to uh, frame what, what, what the uh, debates uh, were about. Um, one editor of Malmö, Nico Schreiter, reviewed uh, a book on anti-Muslim racism by the anti-racist activist Fanny Müller-Uri. It's a, it's a very cool book. Uh, one can learn a lot about the function, like uh, about the, the transformation of anti-Muslim resentment, about uh, theoretical discussions. But yeah, there's also one feature uh, with which I'm I'm also not okay, and I, I would. Um, um, I, I think that uh, Nico was very right to to criticize that in his review of her book. Um, he point, basically pointed out that, that her exclusive focus on criticism of representation would exclude any um, political stance, just what I said before, which is a very uh, Saidian discussion discourse and analytical perspective because if you remember that like uh, one um, basic uh, outcome in uh, Said's book Orientalism is that he claims that the Orient actually does not exist because it's a, it's a construction by the colonizing West. So no uh, Orientalism ever ha can be disentangled from colonialism, one uh, major point and the other, it just doesn't exist. And um, this is a problematic feature um, in Orientalism, which uh, was published in 79, I think, or even prior, or 78, prior to the Iranian uh, uh, revolution in any case, but it turned much more problematic um, this hyper-discursive framing in, in his follow-up book, which was called uh, Covering Islam. In, in Covering Islam, which was published shortly after the Iranian Revolution, he did the following. <laughs> he pointed out uh, demonizing um, Zeitungsartikel, what's that? Newspaper articles, or de some demonizing stances <laughs> on the whole transformation process from a revolution to the Islamization of the revolution to uh, the like totalitarian um, state building process that came out of that. Uh, and basically, he said um, all the so called political criticism on this turning of a, of a nation into a totalitarian state uh, is at the end of the day uh, orientalist description. And, and this is a problem, you can't do that. And this is exactly what uh, Nico Schreiter criticized in, in Fanny Müller-Uri's reception of, uh, uh, of Edward Said uh, because she, she just reproduced that and I completely agree with him. Um, so basically, he objected that uh, this is um, that such perspective. It's it's not as bad, and it's all ascription by the evil West and so on. Is most definitely not the perspective uh, of the masses of Iranian people fighting the religious regime and suffering from it. And so it also got criticized very much uh, um, within. Arab speaking, I don't know, leftist context, mostly by Marxists, who of course uh, did see the political problem here. It just like, there's only one text that reached the West, I would say, um, of Sadiq Jalal al Asm, um, published a year after uh, Said's book, I think, and as a direct answer to this to this framing of uh, the Iranian revolution, that, that, that it's completely wrong and that it has to be disentangled. Yeah, but um, such um, standpoints um, are reproducing themselves and you can trace them in various anti-racist or anti-imperialist so-so contexts and also in Fanny Müller-Uri's book on uh, page 29 which is, uh, yeah, to be, to be tackled, but definitely um, not, not a reason to, to uh, 
forget about the whole book, which is also the, not what uh, Nico Schreiter suggested. He just objected to this um, perspective. And then debates got triggered. And this is actually the um, point I want to illustrate here. Debate started off on Facebook, and it soon got clear that anti-German, <laughs> anti-Deutsche um, contexts uh, were exclusive, exclusively framed as hardcore racist, a big problem for the left, and yeah, and, and then there was a direct answer by uh, editor of Anschläge, Lea Suse Michel who is right <laughs> in a way, but absolutely not right in another way. Uh, if you read, like if you skip through the, the bold um, parts uh, uh, of this quote, she's doing, she's doing exactly that. She um, claims that uh, there is one homogeneous anti-Deutsche, um, I don't know, group, who differentiates at the end of the day not at all from uh, Sarazin and uh, HC Strache. And this is um, actually not true. <laughs> okay, uh, this is a problem. It's not true, and it's a problem because it dismisses, um, first of all, where the whole perspe perspective comes from, yeah? out of anti-fascist organizing and out of a very important criticism um, of Israel-related anti-Semitism. Where she's right is that there are indeed <laughs> parts of the ideology critical perspective who think that uh, nobody talks about Islam. They really have a block of uh, <laughs> of perception <laughs> of how hegemonic the uh, anti-Muslim discourse actually is, and uh, um, about the features, <laughs> and so they are reproducing it, but definitely not the whole perspective. And I'm I'm coming to that quite soon. Yeah. Anyhow, uh, to frame the whole perspective as um, racist and also bellicist. <laughs> Uh, is wrong because it cuts off um, the possibility to talk about current anti-Semitism, and the whole, since the whole discussion also got triggered uh, because Nico Schreiter pointed out uh, that the Iranian regime is a totalitarian shit system. Um, he was immediately bashed as one of these anti-Germans focusing on Iran. Nobody has a clue. And this cuts off any like uh, inner leftist discussion of ambivalent topics such as the fact that the Iranian uh, nuclear pro program uh, like is not an invention of uh, the colonizing West, but a very material. Yeah, uh, uh, it materializes, and it's also related very much. Um, if one thinks back, especially uh, to Ahmadinejad times, to, to a very outspoken eliminatory anti-Semitism. So yeah, of course, there is um, right-wing, um, of course there's right-wing inscriptions in, in, in such discussions and um, stuff, but um, in the very moment, this is also years ago, um, I think 2007 or 8, when like coming out of um, anti-fascist organizing Stop the Bomb was um, founded. It was very clear for like many anti-racist contexts that these guys are hardcore racists and, 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 and nothing else. And yeah. As I said, this just cuts off the possibility to think about uh, anti-Semitism and how it um, articulates currently and that it also articulates uh, in an Islamized way. Last slide regarding uh, anti-racist uh, stances, which 
have blind spots. One um, reason I think that um, this is happening is that, uh, like big parts, <laughs> obviously, um, just agree with um, the framing uh, of Israel as a, as a colonial state, which I would call structurally anti-Semitic. Um, I want to point this out with regard to uh, a text which is not really um, subculture, but uh, it was um, published in the Tats, but also in the wake of uh, anti-Israel protests uh, by Muslim communities. And it was um, an intervention, an anti-racist intervention, um, pointing to the fact that not every uh, demonstration was attended by hardcore anti-Semites, which is definitely true. But um, the guy who wrote it, who is a critical migration researcher, he's also part of Kripnet, if somebody knows that. Uh, that's a Zusammenschluss, what's that? That's, a, that's, a, that's an organization of critical migration researchers who do super cool stuff, they focus very much on the European migration um, um, regime. And yeah, but Vasilis Tsianos should not write about um, current Islamized anti-Semitism because he just doesn't have any clue. And he also shares the structurally anti-Semitic colonial framing. And I just want to explain in short why I think that or why this is my analysis. He does two very um, problematic moves. The first one is that he claimed in his Taz article, which was part of the rubric Debatte Vielfältige Erinnerungskultur, hmm, published in August 2014, so really at the height of all the protests and, and, and against the war in, in Gaza and so on. Um, and label this debating multi-directional memory, vielfältige Erinnerungskultur, which is weird, like in itself, because actually it, it should have been a text in, in like tackling anti-Semitism and, and not um, dislocating the whole um, debate on this uh, remembrance debate or remembrance uh, culture debate, because that's just not true and. In the middle, you see uh, the quote, the direct quote, um, which shows that uh, Vasilis Tsianos is just sharing this structure, the structurally anti-Semitic colonial framing of Israel, because he says, uh, the Muslim protest, the uh, Muslim protest against uh, the occupation of uh, Jerusalem uh, is part of a decolonial, uh, it's part of a decolonial um, ah, remembrance of expulsion, and this decolonial remembrance of uh, remembrance of uh, expulsion does not have any space so far in 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 Germany. First of all, that's not true. <laughs> that, uh, that it has no space. I mean, and if you would skip through. <laughs> Any, any newspaper periodically, he would find out that there is lots of Israel-related like, anti-Semitism going on. And um, above all, the occupation of Jerusalem and um, protesting um, like, in terms of a decolonial um, Vertreibungsgedächtnis, he related <laughs> from all possible demonstrations, and it, it was a lot, uh, to the Akut's day. <laughs> and, and, this is, and, and, and this is really shocking, because like, the, the Akut's day is a perfect example, two sentences about it, um, for Islamized anti-Semitism. It was, it was uh, invented by Khomeini after the Islamization of the revolution in 79, and um, it's only based on pseudo anti-colonial, um, structurally anti-Semitic uh, frames. So that there is uh, occupied Jerusalem, 
and uh, on last uh, Friday in Ramadan, people identifying as Muslims from around the world have to gather and, and protest against this occupation. And it took quite some years to hegemonize this uh, invention of his, which is interesting. Uh, Udo Wolter, um, uh, in his text Beispiel Al-Kutztag, Islamistische Netzwerke und Ideologien, unter Migrantinnen und Migranten in Deutschland um, points this out, that it really took time. Yeah? It didn't fall from the sky that uh, a critical mass of people identifying as Muslims saw it as a, a big priority to uh, go uh, to protest on Al-Quds. Also, if you look, especially in 2014 in the summer, uh, there, there was also an Al-Quds march here in, in Vienna and compared to uh, the UETD organized um, demonstration where several thousand people attended, it was tiny like that. Yeah. But anyhow, if you frame the Al-Quds Day as a decolonial um, remembrance of expulsion, you're definitely on the wrong track and it's a sign that structural anti Israel related anti-Semitism, structural anti-Semitism have to be tackled much more in, in anti-racist context, in, in post-colonial context, and, and also in, within this frame of uh, critical migration studies. Okay, part two. <laughs> part two is about um, the problem I see uh, with the blurring of ideologie critique or Islam crit or ideologie kritischer Islam critique with anti-Muslim stereotyping. After years, also Jungle World <laughs> understood that there is a problem, and uh, they uh, had a short article in their uh, disco. Um, section in uh, uh, like two or three weeks ago by Jonas Feders who pointed to exactly the two things I, I, I would, I would uh, criticize that uh, ideology critical context really tend to uh, underestimate the hegemony of uh, uh, anti-Muslim racism that Islam is a central enemy construction for the, for the right for right wingers all over the place. It also uh, uh, played a major role with uh, bringing Trump to power. If you look at uh, Pew um, statistics, for instance, that's very obvious. Yeah, and that um, not every emancipatory or uh, Marxist uh, criticism of, of religion when it comes to Islam is uh, really an emancipatory one but uh, relates to uh, cultural racism very, very obviously. And then next, uh, now two numbers later, here's the answer <laughs> and you can see nothing is going to change. Unfortunately, the answer is um, who I Anybody pointing to the misery of real existing Muslim communities and the Islamic world generally is equated with Pegida, AFD, or worse. In this, um, no. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, in this way, in this way, it should be prevented uh, that the affinity of Islam to anti-Semitism, hatred against Christians, homophobia, sexism, conspiracy theories, omni potence fantasy is discussed, not speaking of tackling it. Uh, this is uh, the answer to this intervention by Jonas Feders from Georg Wertgesellschaft. And uh, it shows the problem a bit, yeah? because um, those like people who are really unweak <laughs> uh, in this sense, think of themselves as the only ones seeing the problem with Islam, Islamist terrorism, and, and really tackling it, and they really believed it. I, I once attended, um, yeah, well, I know. 
they really believed it and um, they framed themselves as the only ones combating it politically. And I completely disagree with that. I, I, I see it completely the opposite way and I wanna show you why. I'm going a bit back in time now and um, I wanna refer to a text um, by uh, an anti-fascist activist, her name uh, is Natasha Wilting, and it came out in, in a book called um, Mit Freud, uh, which was published by Liliana Radonic and Renate Göllner in, in uh, Saira in the year 2007. Um, it was actually uh, the outcome, the proceedings of a conference mit Freud, Gesellschaftskritik und Psychoanalyse. Um, it's the proceedings, as I uh, said. And one big question um, in, in this uh, conference organized here in Vienna was, how can one use psychoanalytical tools to fight such um, stuff like suicide bombings? One has to um, be aware of the fact that this was in the wake of the, still in the wake of the Second Intifada and, and, and Israel's solidary leftists like, searched for ways to, to come to term with um, this new phenomenon. Because the, in, in, the, uh, in the Second Intifada, the suicide bombing really took over. Yeah? It was like a, a new strategy. All, everybody knows that, I guess. And, and it's also an outcome of Hamas propaganda, which is Islamist propaganda and, and, and stuff like that. So there is a good reason to, to, to tackle that. I just want to show um, on this text um, Die Lust und der Unlust oder warum der Islam so attraktiv ist by Natasha Wilting, um, part of this um, edited volume, that it's just not happening because uh, the author, is doing com completely different things. <laughs> On the one hand, and uh, this is maybe the bigger problem, um, she, she's doing an ontology, ontologization of Islam and of Islamic education practices, which are framed as unescapable. Yeah? It's really hermetic and an authoritarian system which inevitably leads to pathologies. And these pathologies, of course, are anti-Semitism, homophobia, and then um, she also has like several hints in this text and other authors do this too, like Gerhard Scheidt does this too, um, claiming that uh, the Islamic Ummah is like really akin to, to national socialism. <laughs> yeah, and all these pathologies like inevitably produce like suicide bombers. And if you skip through the German um, quotes, you will see that one of the problems is, uh, it's in the first quote, this is, this is not by Natasha Wilting herself, this is uh, the introduction by, by um, Liliana Radonich and Renate Göllner, by the editors, um, that one major problem is this mixing together of um, social categories like an ascribed Islamic family moral and <laughs> jihadi records, like political categories. And, and this is constantly happening in uh, ideology critical approaches which you know, use um, a, a, a certain form of what they think could be psychoanalytically tackling of, um, yeah, of the Zumutungen der islamischen religion. I'm not, um, definitely not denying that religion can destroy you. <laughs> and I'm also not de denying that uh, Freud was completely right that it's a collective uh, psychosis. Oh no, um, what, what, what was it? Not psychosis, but, but uh, it's a collective madness. And of course, um, 
also Islam is connected to patriarchy and, and it is also a repressive system, but to homo homogenize it in, in, in the way that um, Natasha Wilting did in this text, like proclaiming that um, der muslimische Junge, und darin, und, und, and this is a direct quote, darin unterscheiden sich die einzelnen Sekten des Islam, wird bis zu seinem dritten bzw. achten Lebensjahr gestillt, page 155, and this is also a direct quote, bei der gesellschaftlichen Durchsetzung von Lust an der Unlust gleichen sich ein so moderner Islam aufs Haar. And you just can't do that. Yeah, so there, this is the ascription part, which, which is one feature of problematic um, ideology, ideology critical texts. And the second feature is quite funny, because it's, it's also a feature, it's a pattern. It's, it's very often turning up that um, people think they are the only ones fighting for enlightenment, for women's rights, for um, against anti-Semitism and that any form of anti-racist stance leads to a, a dismissal of uh, political criticism on Islam. Yeah? So it's a cultural relativist uh, affirmation <laughs> or an einknicken vor dem Islam beziehungsweise a leftist cultural relativist Islam night, page 143 which is at stake here, and this framing is completely not if you think it through. Um, I showed this, like I, I illustrated this with regard to this very, very old text because I think that uh, these features you can find in Jungle World, in the Bahamas, of course. You can find these features and, and these like um, perceptions of um, the other side, which is the anti-racist side, um, since the year 2007, <laughs> even before. And they obviously, if you look at the, at the last uh, debate in, in the disco section of Jungle World, then they are not going to, to stop so soon. Yeah. And um, this brings me to my next slide, um, which I wanted to, to show, <laughs> because um, Jonas Feders, in his criticism, uh, he pointed to um, a demo aufruf from September uh, 2014 uh, of the Bündnis gegen Israel Kritik Nordrhein-Westfalen, which got criticized pretty soon after it got published by a colleague of mine, by Floris Biskamp, in his text Abgründe der Israel Solidarität, I didn't put it here. And uh, Jonas Feders also relates to that because it not only shows uh, the um, ascription and homogenization problem, but uh, also how, yeah, how these ascriptions really start interfering with a paranoid, um, with a fear of ongoing Islamization, um, which starts paralleling with really, really right-wing positions, like uh, uh, of a Michael Ley, for, for instance who feels Islamized uh, since years and calls for um, um, more Wehrhaftigkeit. What's the English word for that? Wehrhaftigkeit? Ja, no, dass man sich halt tatsächlich wehren kann against Islam. And, and there are positions, Paulette Gensler, for instance, is, is, a, is a person who, who writes for Jungle World and uh, published an article which is called Individuelle Terrorabwehr, Individual Terror Resistance or <laughs> Defense <laughs> uh, on heise.de um, and who is definitely in this paranoia frame. What, what's proposed in this, I didn't put it here, what's proposed in this Individuelle Terrorabwehr is basically <laughs> a better armament with a direct uh, um, 
so uh, the argumentation goes like that. If uh, Israel shows that um, you need to be wary and you need to be armed and you need to be attentive and, and if we would learn more from Israel and how Israel tackles the constant terror uh, in Bataclan would have died uh, less people. And then basically um, the question is, is Graf Maga, hello projection, uh, the best way <laughs> for individual, individual terror up there? And this is paranoid and it's right wing. There's not, nothing to, to add to, uh, to that or to, to, to excuse. And this Bündnis gegen Israel critique like, goes in, in, a, in, in a similar direction. Yeah. Okay, now another turn. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> One outcome of such um, Feindwahrnehmungen, Feindstellungen, in my opinion, is, uh, as I already said before, um, if a certain group of people think that only we are ideology critical enough uh, to see the threat, Islamist terror, for, for instance, um, then everybody, as a counter reaction, so to speak, who points out to both, <laughs> like I do, Islamized anti-Semitism on the one hand, outsourcing of the resentment onto Muslims on the other hand, gets perceived as um, yeah, betraying um, the reine Lehre, I, I, I have to say. I want to illustrate that with regard to uh, a review of a recent publication of the Forschungsgruppe Ideologien und Politiken der Ungleichheit, the second um, edited volume on uh, Rechtsextremismus. And actually, uh, it's, it's a good review by Soma Mohammed Assad. Uh, it uh, got published in the leftist journal Unique. It's a cool review, it's contextualizing the volume, but with one conclusion, and I think this is part of this framing problem. We ideology critics against the anti-racist um, cultural relativists with one conclusion I really disagree <laughs> because she concludes that uh, two authors in, in this collected uh, volume, namely Karina Klammer and Fabian Reicher would call for a positive uh, Islam narrative. This is actually not what's in the book, but what's in the book is <laughs> the fact that uh, both authors, uh, she from a sociological perspective, are working on um, the, like the blitz karriere of de-radicalization and the fact that it's exclusively focusing Muslims. Mm -hmm. And uh, Fabian Reicher from a social worker's perspective um, pointing out that um, de he's also part of a de-radicalization, um, no. uh, he's also in charge for de-radicalizing uh, youth. So he's like kind of really, really in the field. And he also pointed out that there's a, an outsourcing going on. Nobody knows anything about Islamic symbolism and everything gets framed as uh, being potentially like uh, Islamist since some years. And these anti-racist interventions um, exclusively, obviously, get read um, in, in this sense, uh, that both would call for a positive um, Islam narrative. Uh, which uh, would be a big political problem. And this would be interesting to discuss. Well, I don't know, if you, if you come across such um, Patschstellungen or such Feindwahrnehmungen, because in my opinion, in, in the sense of really intervening, and this is also what, what um, most of the authors of this collected volume uh, point to, 
is that it, it's um, very important to acknowledge both. Uh, to acknowledge that there is, is that there is an Islamization of uh, anti-Semitism going on, and that this it, it's a problem, but that there's also this outsourcing going on, and Muslims are depicted as Islamists, radicals, new anti-Semites, and so on. And only if you tackle that in a pedagogical situation, you can make a change, <laughs> which is very like logical <laughs> from a pedagogical logical point of view and um, also like to be connected in my opinion to, to the question how to actually like they put it politically fight <laughs> the resentment I don't know if, if you would like um, I'm, I'm, I don't know how, how um, such ideology critical perspectives imagine how they could like intervene and, and, and uh, actually make a change yeah. Yeah. The last thing I want to discuss um, also pertains to this um, field, <laughs> um, and it can definitely be connected to a, this form of inner left distinction, desire for distinction, being the only ones. Um, fighting for enlightenment or, or fighting against anti-Semitism. And it also shows that um, it has, um, such a stance has actually quite anti-interventionist effect. Okay, but it's a, it's a very controversial topic I'm relating to. Uh, to a recent talk by uh, Rabbi student Armin Langer, who got invited in October to give a talk uh, for an mostly anti-Zionist and anti or uh, anti-racist audience about the blurring of uh, anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism in Vienna. And I thought, cool, he's controversial, but he's really about like tackling anti-Semitism just that nobody believes that he is. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about that, about the ascriptions towards him. And it turned out to be uh, maybe the most Viennese discussion I ever attended. It was a catastrophe, Lager, Denken, well, nobody actually talked unless he made a big effort to talk the anti-Semitism topic through. Um, yeah, so. From uh, the ideology critical side, Lange, of course, <laughs> got uh, criticized a lot. They, they, like, I would say they hate him because he's generally perceived as harming the criticism of anti-Semitism, of harming it via normalizing Islamist political actors. And I just wanna skip through or, or give some hints why, why this is the case. Um, he got criticized, his, uh, his talk in, in, in Vienna got criticized by David Kirsch in, in, um, at the MENA Watch blog and also in Jungle World. I disagree with, uh, with his view. I absolutely do not share it, although I see um, that Langer is a major, I mean Langer is a major attraction figure for anti-Semites, <laughs> because, and, and, and this is a, this is a muster, this is a, this is a pattern. Just some words about him uh, to make that clear. Uh, Armin Langer is the co-founder and coordinator of the Salam Shalom initiative in Neukölln that seeks to establish interface dialogue which is, in my view, a very important goal. And the more you get public with it, the better it is. He's also, on the other hand, a quite controversial figure, and I, I, I find his self-representation in media very problematic because he's doing basically always the same thing. It's a very simple path he's, follow, he's following. Uh, he's framing himself as the anti-racist, <laughs> Jewish-positioned leftist, battling against anti-Muslim resentment in what he even calls the Jewish establishment. I give you two examples, um, which also illustrate that by doing that, 
Also, I'm absolutely sure that this is not intentional and that this guy is also aware of the functionality of anti-Semitism, but not of um, its hegemony. He just underestimates that or ignores that, or I don't know, um, like many people, Jewish pussies, position leftists do that, and um, anti-Semites tend to love them for that and embrace them. Okay, by doing that, um, he, yeah, he's just cutting off uh, real criticism of anti-Semitism. Just to give two, two examples, he appeared in, in the German media scene also in the wake of the Gaza conflict in 2014, which is interesting. And first thing he did was publishing an article in Tagesspiegel called Muslims are the new Jews. Although he differentiates between the resentments, his hint of uh, the fact that anti-Muslim resentment is so all over the place due to its hegemony, uh, he called this article Muslims are the new Jews. So, yeah, this is actually, in my opinion, what people read, <laughs> that anti-Muslim racism has superseded anti-Semitism. And um, even worse, in this uh, artic article, he criticized uh, Berlin-based uh, Rabbi Daniel Alter, who is also in charge for um, his antisemitismus beauftragter of the Berlin Jewish community, and who got attacked um, when he was walking in Neukölln, which is, you know, a, a migration um, bezirk, what's the name for that, a migration part of the city, like, yeah, low socioeconomic uh, level, lots of people with migration background, and Daniel Alter got physically attacked when walking down there with his uh, daughter, and uh, definitely by youngsters identifying as Muslims. And after that, he made this incident public and called Neukölln or parts of Neukölln is um, um, called it a no-go area for Jews. But without any generalization uh, that uh, anti-Semitism would be an intrinsic Islamic or Muslim problem. He never said it. And uh, Lange ignores both the attack and the, uh, the fact that Daniel Alter never did any like um, homogenizing ascriptions after this attack. Yeah, if you take a look at uh, the self-description of the Salam Shalom initiative, it's even written there, which is also not the best way to, to tackle contentions, that uh, it was, or it was like founded as a reaction on, as a reaction to public statements of this Daniel Alter, uh, who denominated Neukölln as a no-go area. And in December 5th, 2015, um, Armin Langer criticized also the president of the Central Council of Jews in Germany, Josef Schuster, who really did an, an at least an ambivalent like, um, statement. He criticized him for bringing up the topic of uh, limitation of uh, above all Syrian refugees or refugees in general due to the danger of importing Islamized anti-Semitism. And uh, Langer wrote a Taz article criticizing that and um, proposing that the Central Council should be renamed into Central Council of Racist Jews. And yeah, despite this rhetoric, which is problematic because it, like before, it, um, it um, impedes uh, um, tackling of Islamized anti-Semitism. Yeah? If you just frame yourself as the good guy who's anti-racist and who never had any bad experiences in, in Neukölln and blah, and um, then you frame the others as, as exclusively racist just because they, they point to, to obvious problems. Yeah. yeah. 
But despite uh, such problematic features, uh, I would say that uh, a public figure such as Armin Langer is really important in times like these because he's really uh, seeking to establish an interface dialogue and like other Jewish position leftist, to the Butler effect, uh, he, for instance, he, he is just a, like an, a, an attraction person for anti-Semites. <laughs> I also, um, I, I really disagree with parts of ideology um, critical stances toward Judy Butler because they, they project all the anti-Semitism charge on her and rather I think it, uh, it would be much more important or much more interesting also and I also don't think that she's an anti-Semite. She's just, just like ignoring like he does, or even more, m much more, and not really well informed about the Middle East. But rather than projecting all that like you know, anti-Semitism charge on figures like Judith Butler, or in this case, Armin Langer, because uh, yeah, this is uh, uh, definitely also what, what would David Kirsch, I, I think this is corresponding to David Kirsch framing that he's like a fifth column pretending to be critical but in, at the end of the day he's not. Yeah, rather, to, uh, rather than projecting that it, it would be much more interesting to um, analyze the function of either Jewish or much more uh, Israeli leftists for um, anti-Zionist, anti-Semites. I call it uh, to the Butler effect on the one hand, that they get embraced so much until, for instance, uh, if they are not like uh, Norman Finkelstein. I don't know if somebody remembers that, but some years ago Norman Finkelstein spoke out about uh, against BDS, and since then <laughs> nobody relates to him anymore. The same with Uri Avnery, who uh, published an article which is even published in, in German, um, pointing out that Israel is actually not an apartheid state, and since then, like they are like out of the radar. But Armin Langer is coming in <laughs> for, for such uh, justification um, desires. Yeah, I think this was also for me personally the, the um, saddest part of this uh, non-discussion in October. That on the one hand, um, much more of them anti-imperialists showed up to get their anti-Semitism justified, which in my view didn't work out so well, but, but in parts it did. And on the other hand, the local Israel solidarity showed up to accuse him of a belittlement of um, anti-Semitism and like more Islamism. Why that? Uh, Two last sentences on Armin Langer. Uh, why is he accused of a belittlement of um, Islamist political actors? Um, this doesn't come from nowhere. On the one hand, he's um, collaborating with DTIP in his uh, Salam Shalom initiative. And on the other hand, he uh, had a lecture last in, in March 2015. He gave a lecture on anti-Semitism at a local branch of uh, the Islamist organization Mili Görish. One can definitely discuss if this is um, a sort of normalization, but on the other hand, me personally, and this was also part of, of his uh, answer to the criticism, couldn't imagine a better context <laughs> to tackle Islamized anti-Semitism than Mili Görish. For instance, I mean, for sure, it's not the anti-Deutsche Antifa who, who is to be addressed in, in the first place with this topic. Yeah, but he definitely should also readjust his media his media presence because the last thing he did, speaking of he is attracting anti-Semites, he gave an interview to Jakob Augstein. Who is a known and who is very well known for his Israel-related anti-Semitism? He even was one of the top ten anti-Semitic, anti-Israel slurers um, denominated by Simon Wiesenthal Center in 2012. And uh, in this interview, um, Langer gave 
Augstein a forum to be more critical of anti-Semitism than Lange is. And this is, this is, this is such a pattern of how um, also BDS Austria turned up uh, uh, at Lange's talk to, to get their Israel-related anti-Semitism legitimized by, by a Jewish positioned um, person. Yeah, well, I think uh, I leave it here. Um, I just want to say in contrast to, to ideology critical perspectives, um, which as you can see here, don't take uh, such interventions serious, but rather see them as a normalization problem. I think one should do such things. One should also um, found uh, initiatives like Salam Shalom. It's, it's high time, and it shouldn't get framed as dismissing anti-Semitism. It's, it's basically the factual work of tackling Islamized anti-Semitism in a migration uh, society with the concrete political actors at hand. And that these guys are no left-wingers is a bit logical, I would say, and uh, for sure it's no, no surprise. Even Ahmed Mansour, <laughs> just to say that, uh, who is a Palestinian-German psychologist, also tackling Islamist structures, in other words, definitely not a person uh, who is on this cultural relativist side, definitely very highly critical. Even him, he called on Mili Görisch uh, to, talk, to tackle anti-Semitism uh, more. He did that in, in the wake of the anti-Israel protests in summer 2014 in Süddeutsche Zeitung. But such you know, positions get ignored in Jungle World articles like that because they are, yeah not um, pointing at uh, discussion also neither. It's more about bashing at the end of the day. Yeah, so how to intervene politically? I don't know, this would be a, a, a thing I, I would love to, to discuss, how to tackle Islamized anti-Semitism without uh, ascribing um, the resentment exclusively onto like Muslim collectives. And um, I wanted to end my presentation, since this is an anti-fascist congress, with, with um, like a plea in direction, ideology, criticism, because I see some quite dead ends here uh, with regard to the acknowledgement that such a thing like <laughs> anti-Muslim racism even exists. So um, just a few sentences about that. I start with the anti-racists first. Uh, there is definitely a lack of theoretical understanding of anti-Semitism, especially Israel-related one. This is partly due to this Saidian anti-imperialist framing of colonizing West against uh, subaltern rest and um, the fact that such a framing, uh, as I have illustrated before, hopefully understandable, impedes political criticism in framing it uh, as yeah, Western racism. And um, this is the bigger problem. <laughs> the next point, uh, partly or maybe mostly, I don't know, uh, it's uh, related to the fact that Israel-related anti-Semitism is shared at least the colonial framing. That people like Vasilis Tianos think, actually, it is about, the whole thing is about a decolonial, uh, decoloniales Vertreibungsgedächtnis. So, they, so actually, they, they have a point in, in protesting. And, they can, and um, such positions uh, that share the colonial framing, and I'm looking very much at such positions because I'm working on, on post-colonial uh, perspectives on Israel. Yeah, which, and all of them share this colonial framing. And um, yeah, so at the end of the day, uh, people like agree too much for disentangling resentment from political criticism. 
And coming back to ideology critical contexts, <laughs> lack of theoretical understanding of uh, racism and how it functions uh, on a representational level. And um, second point, um, I didn't go into that, but, but I think it's really important. I, in my opinion, um, people like Natasha Wilting, um, who really think that in reading certain texts like Quran, can develop something like a psychoanalytical approach to explain Muslim fascism hmm, or Muslim pathologies. I think they think, and I also think that um, Gerhard Scheidt actually thinks that, that they are doing sort of the same thing uh, like uh, Sigmund Freud has done in The Man Moses, if you know that. Freud, um, in The Man Moses, um, Freud like, makes the point that, uh, in a nutshell, no, huh? anti-Semitism obviously has Christian roots. And he digs into some holy texts plus political information about who Moses was and so on and so forth to, to um, prove that. And people who are doing Quran exegesis, Quran exegese, Gerhard Scheid is one of them, and uh, also Natasha Wilting works like that. She, 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 she um, pulls out four or five Sure and does a bit of exegesis, and then she deduces on a Muslim pathological character. And I think that this is exactly the opposite uh, of what Freud did in The Man Moses. Because this was his last book. He, he wrote it already in exile, and it was his, uh, like, um, he, Two, two years later, he was even dead, so he was really like, he had a whole life um, behind him working as a psychoanalyst and uh, understanding from anti Semites lying on his couch his whole work life through how the resentment func functions in the individual at the beginning of the 20th century Austrians. And after listening to so much accounts uh, of people lying on his couch, he obviously had the idea to, to trace that anti-Semitic shit down in, in the text. But um, ideology critics do the worst. You know what I mean? They just dig into the text. There's no, not even um, an attempt to check back via interviews or something at least, if uh, that Muslim is really so fascist, like uh, the, the surah number, the one with um, pigs and apes and, and so on, suggests. And I think that this is, this is not only an analytical problem, it's, it's a political one, because um, uh, uh, exegesis of uh, holy texts or Quran or whatsoever, um, which does not care about how the ideology articulates in individual persons, leads to ascriptions. It has to, because it doesn't care about the translation process of ideology into people, concrete people. Yeah. So my last slides go to ideology critics who still don't believe that there is something like uh, anti-Muslim racism <laughs> at stake in times like these. I, I just wanna, but really skipping through, actually I, I just tell you the point I wanna make because it's really late. Poor pistol. <laughs> no discussion, I guess. <laughs> okay, what I, what I wanna show with this slide is that it's very, very obvious how um, structural anti-Semitism and anti-Muslim racism function together. If you look at um, the last elections, the main reasons for voting for Hofer, 50%, if you remember, and it's going to get worse, huh? in the presidential election, 
he understands the fears of people like me, he's one of us, uh, um, uh, item one, anger and disappointment with politics. 86%, uh, 68% uh, uh, respective, 63% uh, on the Hofer side and look at Van der Bellen, oh, uh, it must be <laughs> 37 down there, but you see that uh, the structural anti-Semitic Hofer is anti-establishment, Trump is anti-establishment, Brexit brings us away from Moloch European Union, so we are anti-establishment and, and, and so on. Um, this structural anti-Semitic anti-establishment frame, which is a complete bullshit, as we know, uh, was the most successful um, influencing factor uh, for mobilizing people uh, to vote for Hofer. He got the votes of uh, dissatisfied people. And um, unfortunately, uh, this, is, this is taken from Sora. You can, you can uh, check it out also uh, by yourself if you're, if you're interested. They don't have many uh, analysis online, but, but some glimpses. And unfortunately, I think they did ask about uh, the effect of anti-Muslim uh, resentment on uh, voting for a freedom party. But they didn't put it online and they uh, unfortunately didn't answer my email. But um, if, you, if you look at the main reasons for voting for the Freedom Party in Styria last year, reason number one was immigration and integration, which is a code for refugee crisis, which is a code for Syrian refugees, which is a code for the Muslims <laughs> flooding Europe. And the second one, also very, 52%, uh, and the second one uh, was inner security and crime, which is a code for refugee crisis, Syrians, Muslims taking over. The same if you have a look at uh, Pew, uh, P-E-W um, uh, statistic, um, that, that's an American uh, NGO and maybe also think tank, but anyhow, they do ve very good and very, um, uh, constant analysis and they also analyzed the, the, the current uh, election of course and uh, they had similar outcomes with regard to uh, the anti-establishment frame. Hmm? Trump managed very well to, to frame him more anti-establishment than Hillary Clinton. Also he is like financing fi Wise, but but, but uh, in politics for years and years, and definitely not anti-establishment, such as Hofer, who is the Dritte Nationalratspräsident. Uh, and uh, with regard to anti-Muslim and anti-immigration frame, um, the, the major reasons for uh, voting for Trump were, well, first, economy, and uh, second, uh, who is really able to combat Islamist terrorism? That was, that was the second item. So if you think all this together, like Brexit, Trump election, presidential election in Austria, elections, one has to, has to say, you can, you can easily recognize that these two resentments also completely different in their functionality, power projection in terms of structural anti-Semitism, and yeah, outsourcing into, into, a, um, into another <laughs> fear scenario, um, which is, which is uh, a danger via terrorism, but not colonizing us and, and letting all these uh, terrorists in, which was definitely also a big topic in, in, in the Brexit vote. <laughs> European Union like colonizes us and lets all the Muslims in who are going to um, put us a bomb in, in, in the tube and so on. So this uh, goes together. And in my opinion, also if you, uh, this is from New York Times, um, uh, a graph that shows, uh, uh, graphics, <laughs> that shows the rise uh, of right-wing and radical right-wing parties in Europe in the last years, 89 to 2016, in Austria, 2012 to 16, the last elections. If you 
uh, keep that in mind, I think it's also very important for the left to overcome this anti-Muslim, first of all, the rejection that, the, that, that there is um, anti-Muslim hegemonic discourse at stake also with regard to uh, recent elections and so on, and yeah, to overcome the, at least the parts that stereotype uh, themselves. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there are any questions, but it's it's three to one. <laughs> <laughs>